Make no mistake, the folks in Beijing are keenly watching this visit. I bet they won't like what they see. A massive reception, a state banquet, all of its signals growing cooperation between India and the US. And that's bad news for China. Back in New Delhi, there is consensus on one thing. China is the new big challenge, not Pakistan. China is a challenge. Here in Washington, there is a similar consensus. China and not Russia is the chief rival now. So there is unity on that front. There may be difference on the approach, but the sentiment is the same. China means bad news. How is Beijing reacting to this consensus? Well, there are five stages of grief, they say, and China is on the first stage. Denial. Their former foreign minister, Wang Yi, wrote an opinion piece this week. The headline sums up the story. This is what it says. India's economic ties with the US cannot replace its trade with China. One question though. Is he telling this to the world or trying to convince himself? Now, Wang Yi is still a prominent figure in Beijing. When US Secretary of State Antony Blinken visited China, he had three meetings and one of those meetings was with Wang Yi. So what he says carries weight. It's not the musings of a former diplomat. Let me quote some important bits from what he has written. As feared by many Indian elites, Washington's vigorous efforts to strengthen economic and trade cooperation with India is primarily to slow down China's economic development. Let me simplify that. Wang Yi says America has an ulterior motive, that they're using India only to weaken China. He says Washington pays lip service but seldom delivers. Broadly speaking, this op-ed has three arguments. One, America is not genuine, it is only using India. Two, India cannot replace China in the global supply chain. And three, nothing can stop the rise of China-US trade or India-China trade. Now let's analyze these arguments. Is America really playing India? Well, if they are, the acting is top class, we have to say. It's up to Joe Biden to disprove Wang Yi's statement. India has made the leap of faith. The US needs to reciprocate with concrete moves. As for supply chain and trade, it's too early for that, really. Yes, bilateral trade is growing, but these things cannot change overnight, or for that matter, in one or two years. Realigning trade and supply is a long game. It takes years. The fact that India and the US are doing that, working towards that, has spooked Beijing. Wang Yi also has some advice for New Delhi. He says, promote trade and cooperation with China. Well, why not? It's not like China tried to seize Indian territory or kill Indian soldiers. Except they did exactly that. India's position on China has been clear. In fact, the Prime Minister reiterated it during an interview. This is what he said. For normal ties with China, peace and tranquility in the border is essential. China doesn't seem to understand that. Their proposal is this. Forget the border. Let's increase trade. I'm afraid that won't fly. America's equation with China is also complicated, minus the border. Let's look at the events of this week. Joe Biden sent his top diplomat, Antony Blinken, to Beijing. The expectations were rock bottom. And so were the results. It was actually classic Cold War playbook. Both sides agreed to stabilize relations, but they did nothing to actually implement that. In fact, Biden may be doing the opposite. He attended a campaign event on Tuesday, Joe Biden. And he spoke about the spy balloon saga between the US and China. And while doing that, he called Xi Jinping a dictator. He said Xi was embarrassed because he didn't know where the balloon was. Needless to say, China is not happy. Their foreign ministry has called it absurd and irresponsible. The relevant remarks by the US side are extremely absurd, irresponsible and seriously violate basic facts, diplomatic protocol and China's political dignity. They are an open political provocation. China is strongly dissatisfied with and firmly opposed to this. Question to China though. What do you call an unelected leader who has appointed himself for life? If not a dictator, then what? Biden and Modi will have to figure that out. China may not be the only issue on the agenda, but it's an important and urgent one. Something that even voters in both countries realize, which is why Biden said that he did what he did rather at the campaign event. He called she a dictator. New Delhi and Washington will have to figure out a roadmap. What will the US-India plan against China look like? Is it purely economic? Is it purely strategic? Is it a mix of the two? Let's see if tomorrow's bilateral gives us some answers to these questions.
Let's recap day one of Prime Minister Modi's visit. He landed in New York around afternoon. The scenes were as expected. A big Indian-American crowd had gathered at the airport. There was dancing, singing and a lot of noise. We spoke about how vibrant the Indian-American community is and that vibrancy was on full display. The crowds weren't just at the airport though. They also gathered elsewhere in New York, like at the iconic Times Square and in front of the hotel where Prime Minister Modi was staying. It was overwhelming but on expected lines. After soaking in the welcome, the Prime Minister got down to business. He didn't have any political engagements though, but he did meet some important people. There were discussions with think tanks, healthcare experts and academics, plus sit-downs with Elon Musk and Neil deGrasse Tyson. The meeting with Musk is getting a lot of attention. It was their second meeting and afterwards everyone was asking the same question. Will Tesla come to India? Well, Musk hinted at some positive news. He said that he's planning to visit India next year and that Tesla will begin India operations as soon as possible. Listen to this. He really cares about India because he's, he's pushing us to make significant investments uh, in India, which uh, it is something that we, that we intend to do. Um, and we're just for, trying to figure out the right timing. I am a fan of Modi, so, <laughs> so I have to say that. So what's stopping Musk? Apparently taxes. India's import duty on electric vehicles is 60% and more. Elon Musk wants India to reduce that. And what's the government saying? Well, why bother with importing? Set up a factory and make your cars inside India. That's reportedly the government's position. No import, no taxes. Perhaps we could see an arrangement soon. But that was day one. Day two is also about yoga, all about yoga, you could say. Today is the 21st of June, which is International Yoga Day. The Prime Minister was at the United Nations headquarters he led a mega event in front of the lawns. Take a look at this. Yoga is free from copyright. The power of yoga, not only to be healthy, happy, but also to be kind to ourselves and to each other. Let us use the power of yoga to build bridges of friendship, a peaceful world, and a cleaner, greener, and sustainable future. We are told this was a world record. You've heard about the health benefits of yoga, now hear about the political benefits. Yoga is India's gift to the world. It's a major soft power tool. Prime Minister Modi recognized this early on in his term. In 2014, he addressed the United Nations General Assembly for the first time. This was his message on yoga. Yoga keval vyayam bhar na hokar apne aap se tatha vishwa va prakruti ke saath तादात्म्य को प्राप्त करने का माध्यम है आइए हम एक अंतरराष्ट्रीय योग दिवस को आरंभ करने की दिशा में कार्य करें यूनाइटेड नेशंस लिसन द वेरी नेक्स्ट ईयर इंटरनेशनल योगा डे वाज सेलिब्रेटेड एंड नाउ इट्स एन एनुअल इवेंट वी सी मेजर सिटीज होल्डिंग मास योगा इवेंट्स ऑन दिस डे वी सी एंबेसीज जॉइनिंग इन ऑल ऑफ दिस सिग्नल्स योगा सॉफ्ट पावर क्रेडेंशियल्स इन फैक्ट आई हैव सम नंबर्स फॉर यू in 2019, the global yoga market was worth $37 billion. We're talking about a wide range of things, like yoga mats, online classes, studios. All of this made up $37 billion. By 2027, it is expected to reach $66 billion. That's a growth of 9% per year. Here in the US, it's a big hit. There are more than 48,000 yoga studios and Pilates studios across the country. Plus, I'm sure a lot of online ones. How does this growth help India? 
For starters, familiarity. Through yoga, a lot of people will learn about India, our ancient practices, our culture, and of course, our core beliefs. Think of it as an introductory course to the country. The Prime Minister talked about this today. He linked yoga to New Delhi's emerging worldview. Listen to this. Yujjate etad iti yoga arthat jo jodta hai wo yog hai isliye yog ka ye prasar us vichar ka vistar hai jo pure sansar ko ek parivar ke roop mein samahit karta hai योग के विस्तार का अर्थ है वसुधैव कुटुंबकम की भावना का विस्तार वसुधैव कुटुंबकम मींस द वर्ल्ड इज वन फैमिली इट्स आल्सो द स्लोगन ऑफ इंडियाज जी ट्वेंटी प्रेसिडेंसी सो योगा कैन एक्सपोर्ट इंडियन कल्चर एंड वर्ल्ड व्यू टू अदर कंट्रीज बट देयर आर मटेरियल गेन्स टू लाइक योगा टूरिज्म व्हेन पीपल लर्न अबाउट योगा दे विल वांट टू विजिट द प्लेस ऑफ इट्स ओरिजिन टू सी हाउ योगा इज प्रैक्टिस्ड इन इंडिया Now it's hard to say how big this industry is, but I'll give you a ballpark idea. Global tourism is worth around three trillion dollars, and around fourteen percent of that is wellness tourism. Yoga would slot right into that. The event at the United Nations headquarters is all about visibility. Most people already know about yoga. Today's event was for those who did not. With that, the Prime Minister's New York leg came to an end. His next step is here in Washington DC. We're expecting him to land in the next hour or so. And here there is not much room for soft power. It's all about hard power, talks and strategy, defense deals and geopolitical challenges. And one country will dominate those talks, India's northern neighbor and America's chief rival, China. So this is what we have, both celebrations and criticism, as you would expect with any major visit. and behind the scenes some serious work is also being done we've been telling you about the defense deals they are on top of the agenda the americans are going all out the stage was set over the last few weeks biden sent his biggest cabinet members to india the defense minister and the national security advisor in quick succession two weeks ago lloyd austin landed in new delhi he is the us defense secretary it's their version of a defense minister he met with the indian defense minister rajnath singh and the two leaders agreed on a road map for defense cooperation The U.S. India partnership is a cornerstone of a free and open Indo-Pacific, and our deepening bonds show how tech technological innovation and growing military cooperation between two great powers can be a force for global good. And so, on this visit, I am pleased that we have taken new steps to strengthen our defense partnership. We established. An ambitious new roadmap for defense industrial cooperation. Some two decades back, this would have sounded impossible, but today it's all happening. It shows how far the India-U.S. relationship has come. On this visit, some major defense deals are expected. We'll be able to confirm the specifics only when the official announcement has been made. But we can tell you that there will be two broad parts to it: jet engines and drones. I'll tell you about the jet engines first. A deal is in the works. It involves two companies: America's General Electric and India's Hindustan Aeronautics Limited, or HAL. Now, this is extremely significant because they're talking about joint production. GE will transfer its technology to HAL. HAL will use this technology to produce engines in India. These engines will then be used for our indigenous Tejas jets. How does it help India? Well, India wants to expand its domestic defense production, and this deal is going to help. It's a much-needed boost for the industry. Also, a major shift in America's approach towards India. You see, such military technology is guarded by countries. It's a strategic asset. The Americans are very choosy about whom they share it with. And in the past, they've denied India access to critical tech, but now they're offering it, even pushing for it. And this shows how much they're ready to invest in the partnership. The other part of the defense deal is drones. India is looking to buy armed drones, around 30 MQ-9B Predator drones. They're manufactured by a company called General Atomics Aeronautical Systems Inc. We spoke to the CEO of that company. 
Dr. Vivek Lal on what they plan to do, which drones India wants to buy and how soon they can be delivered. We'll bring you a part of that conversation in a bit. But first, let me tell you more about the deal. It is said to be worth $3 billion. The Defense Acquisition Council has approved it. So there's a good chance that this deal will be announced during this visit. India could get defense tech and drones, but that's not all. The US is also keen on the fighter jet program for the Navy and the Air Force. It's pushing Boeing Super, Boeing Super Hornets and the F-21s. Another key aspect is BECA. BECA it stands for Basic Exchange and Cooperation Agreement. Both nations are expected to sign on certain clauses this time. And this pact, BECA was first signed in the year 2020. It helps India get sensitive data from US military satellites, something that could help in the border standoff with China. So India is clearly getting a lot. But what's in it for the Americans? Well, two things. One is weaning India off dependence on Russian weapons. And two, countering China. India, remember, is the world's biggest importer of weapons. It depends on Russia for most of its military supplies. But the Ukraine war changed that. Moscow is preoccupied right now. New Delhi is still waiting for the delivery of two S-400 missile systems. So India wants to look at other options. And that's where the United States comes in. It seems like a perfect combination. In the past, though, it was far from perfect. For decades, India and the US had a frosty relationship, especially during the Cold War, even after that. Remember, during the Kargil War, India wanted GPS, the US said no. Same for nuclear submarines. India wanted them, Washington denied. In fact, until the year 2008, India-US defense trade was negligible. Fast forward to 2020, it was over $20 billion. So clearly the distrust is gone. Washington knows that it needs New Delhi and defense ties have become crucial to this relationship. In fact, in an interview to the Wall Street Journal, Prime Minister Modi called the India-US defense cooperation, quote unquote, an important pillar of partnership. Well, they're on the right trajectory. What they need is sustained engagement and the right mix of incentives. It could take this partnership to new heights. So the defense deal is making all the buzz, but there's another sector where the US and India are cooperating and that's semiconductors or chips. They're often called the oil of the 21st century, the key to global domination. So it's no surprise that chips are a contested asset. The US and China are both trying to dominate this market. They're locked in what's called a chip war. As of today, Washington is leading the race, but China is catching up fast. Where does that leave India? Well, at a vantage point, we say, as a credible alternative to China and a reliable partner for the world. The US wants to move away, away from China. It wants to make sure that Beijing doesn't get critical technology. It wants to build semiconductors with like-minded countries, AKA India. This is called friendshoring, offshoring with friendly countries. That's friendshoring for you. And this is a big opportunity for India because irrespective of what the US wants, India has been pushing itself as an alternative to China. India does not have native semiconductor firms, so it's trying to woo foreign giants. And part of this push is a $10 billion incentive plan. It is aimed at boosting semiconductor manufacturing. And this works well for the US as well. America can support India as it tries to weaken China's chip industry. Again, this looks like a natural fit, and they've been at it for a while. In September last year, the Quad took up this issue. They moved to secure semiconductor supply chains. The Quad, as you know, is a member of four is a group rather of four countries, four members: India, America, Japan, and Australia. And in March this year, an MOU was signed. A memorandum of understanding was signed. It was signed between India and the US. This was to establish a semiconductor supply chain. Reports say India has now cleared a $2.7 billion micron chip testing plant. Micron is a major chip company in America. They will set up a plant in India. And this came just ahead of Prime Minister Modi's state visit. The plan is to set up a semiconductor testing and packaging unit. It will be built in the state of Gujarat. India has promised production-linked incentives. We're talking about incentives worth $1.34 billion. Remember, this is the same Micron, the same company that China has recently banned. Washington is asking American firms to invest in India and to move away from China. And the Micron plant is a good start. But this unit will only test and pack semiconductor chips. It won't make in India. New Delhi will have to aim for that, for making in India. For India to dominate the chip market, it will have to manufacture chips. Currently, 
The chip global supply chain is complicated. Chips are designed in the United States, they're manufactured in Taiwan and South Korea, and then they're assembled in China. If India wants to become a key player, it will have to move fast. It will have to ramp up manufacturing. The plans are already in place. India will get its first semiconductor plant in Gujarat. It is being built by Taiwan-based Foxconn and India's Vedanta. Similarly, ISMC Digital is planning to build a $3 billion fabrication plant. This will be located in the state of Karnataka. So India has the potential to become a key manufacturer if things move in the same direction and at the same pace. India could achieve that in three to four years. And then it should start work on the next step. Dream bigger. Think about chip design. As of today, it sounds like a long shot. But remember, India has exceptional talent pool. 20% of the world's semiconductor design engineers are from India. The government has launched a chip design center. The idea is to encourage a chip design ecosystem in India with or without American support. Back to Washington and amid all the buzz about the state visit, the Bidens are in an awkward spot. This is thanks to the president's son, Hunter Biden. He's caught in legal trouble and he's set to plead guilty for tax evasion. But that's only half the story. As the White House rolls out the red carpet for Prime Minister Modi, it is facing a flurry of allegations and accusations. The charge is that Hunter Biden has got off too easy and that the US Justice Department is going soft on him. Now, Hunter Biden is no stranger to controversy. For years now, he's made news for the wrong reasons. In this instance, the timing couldn't have been worse. Our next report tells you what the charges are and how the president is dealing with them in an election year. Parents aren't usually very upbeat when their son is found committing a crime, much less admitting that he committed a crime. What are we talking about? Hunter Biden will plead guilty to tax evasion. He has also struck a deal with the U.S. Justice Department on a separate gun charge. But the Bidens aren't ordinary parents. Joe Biden is the President of the United States. And Jill Biden, his wife, the First Lady. They are powerful people. People that have lived life large in the political circles of Washington, D.C. Hunter Biden has had a rough life so far. He has dabbled in drugs, multiple relationships including with his own sister-in-law, and even crimes. Yes, crimes. That's where things get serious and not just any crime. We are talking about tax evasion. Now that's a whole different ball game altogether, especially coming from Hunter Biden, son of the sitting US president. But Joe Biden doesn't seem very concerned. Mr. President, have you spoken to your son today? Have you spoken to Hunter today? Mr. President, any reaction to his guilty plea? There's more. The White House has issued a short statement. It said the President and the First Lady love their son and support him as he continues to rebuild his life. We will have no further comment. Let's quickly tell you what the case against Hunter Biden is. The years were 2017 and 2018. Hunter Biden was supposed to pay the government $100,000 in taxes each year. But he didn't. Now that's a crime. For his failure to pay taxes, Hunter Biden technically faces two years in prison. But there's another charge against him. This one is gun-related. In 2018, a firearm owned by Hunter Biden was found in a dumpster in Wilmington, Delaware, apparently tossed off by his then-girlfriend. It was not a major crime until 2021 when Hunter decided to reveal that he was addicted to drugs at the time. That revelation raised the possibility that he broke federal law by purchasing a firearm and for that charge, he faces 10 years in prison. So put together, Hunter Biden faces a maximum penalty of 12 years in prison for A. Tax evasion and B. For illegally purchasing and possessing a firearm. But now, Hunter Biden will plead guilty to the tax charges and struck a deal on the gun charge. So he is very unlikely to be sent to prison. But the Republicans have pounced on the opportunity to hit out at the US President. Donald Trump took to Truth Social to vent saying... Wow, 
the corrupt Biden DOJ just cleared up hundreds of years of criminal liability by giving Hunter Biden a mere traffic ticket. Our system is broken. Republicans are comparing the Justice Department's treatment of Trump and Hunter Biden and claiming that there's an obvious bias at play. Whether that's true or not, Joe Biden would rather not have the Hunter Biden scandal break out right now. President Biden is upping the ante against guns and he's also a champion of the wealthy paying more taxes. So his son illegally owning a gun and evading taxes does make things very awkward for senior Biden. Hunter Biden's controversies did not stop Joe Biden from becoming president in 2021. But the big question is, will it derail his re-election bid? Before I begin the next story, brace yourself for some random facts about a seaport. But trust me, by the time I finish the story, it'll all make sense. We are talking about the port of Karachi. It is located in Pakistan. It first opened in the year 1857. And today it is the country's largest and busiest seaport. It handles about 25 million tons of cargo every year. That's about 60% of the nation's cargo. And this port is crucial, not just for Pakistan, but also for South Asia. It is one of the largest and busiest in the region. But why do you need to know all of this about the Karachi port? Because Pakistan is selling it. The country, as you know, is in crisis, in desperate need of money, so it is selling a key asset. The Pakistan government has drafted a five-year agreement. They want to hand over four berths at the Karachi port. Do you know who the buyer is? The UAE, the United Arab Emirates. And this is not even the most interesting part. You have to see the pace of deal negotiations. They're moving at breakneck speed. A cabinet committee was set up, led by Finance Minister Ishak Dar. It met with Abu Dhabi stakeholders this week, back-to-back -back meetings on Monday and Tuesday. They quickly finalized the framework agreement and pushed for a go-ahead from the federal cabinet. As fast as that, it's only a matter of days now. A commercial deal is set to be signed in the next few days. Now, if you followed government contracts in general, you would know that these things take months, even years. So to have wrapped it up in just a few days is exceptional. Either the Pakistanis are very, very efficient or very desperate. I don't want to say which, but I'll tell you this. Pakistan is stuck in an economic vortex. The inflation rate has risen to about 38%. The cost of food is soaring and it's only worsened since last summer. Last summer is when Pakistan suffered devastating floods. They caused damages worth $30 billion, 30 billion. The country is already buried under a pile of debt. It now faces the risk of default, meaning it may not be able to pay its EMIs on time. Pakistan had signed a bailout deal with the IMF in 2019, the Inter Mon International Monetary Fund. It was a deal worth $6.5 billion. This is the money that the IMF was supposed to give to Pakistan. But for this, Pakistan had to fulfill certain conditions. It did not. So bulk of the money has not come. And this deal is set to expire by the end of this month. In the next few days, Pakistan wants to revive it, but chances are dim. So selling the Karachi port may be a last ditch attempt to raise some cash. And perhaps Islamabad saw this coming because last year, their government passed a law. It's called the Intergovernmental Commercial Transactions Act. This law is aimed at selling state assets and fast tracking such sales to raise funds. The Karachi port deal is the first transaction under this law. But why the UAE? Because the UAE is Pakistan's third largest trading partner. The first two are China and the United States. Average annual trade between the two countries stands at $8 billion. It is also an ideal export destination for Pakistan because the distance between the two countries is not very much. So transportation costs are limited. Also politically and financially, the UAE has supported Pakistan in the past. Hence this deal. But it only reflects the dire straits that the country is in Selling state assets to raise cash is the last of the last resorts. It can be a dangerous trend for a rogue nuclear state. Our next story is about the Titanic, the doomed ocean liner. It was once the world's largest steamship. It was called unsinkable. But on the 15th of April 1912, it went down during its maiden voyage. 1,500 people on board were killed. Decades have passed since. But its mystique has endured. 
It is now considered one of history's most famous shipwrecks. People risked their lives to catch a glimpse of it. And last week, five people did just that. They sealed themselves inside a deep sea submarine. They embarked on a voyage. Except now, they've gone missing. It's a race against time to save them. Our next report tells you more. These are the last seen visuals of Titan, a tourist submarine. Last Sunday, it embarked on a voyage in the North Atlantic to the Titanic shipwreck. Titanic was the largest ship of its time. It hit an iceberg on its maiden voyage in 1912 and became the holy grail of undiscovered shipwrecks. Its wreckage was found on the seabed in 1985. Since then, it has been extensively explored. By the likes of Ocean Gate Expeditions, this is a tourist company. And it charges guests for $250,000 for an eight-day expedition to the famous wreck which sits over 12,000 feet beneath the surface. Ocean Gate submarine embarked on one such journey last week. With five people on board, including a British billionaire. The group was sealed inside the sub. External bolts locked them in. Soon after the dive, the submarine went missing. Contact was lost an hour and 45 minutes into the dive, when the vessel was more than halfway down towards the wreck. Now, United States and Canadian rescue teams are scrambling to search for the submarine. Racing against time to find it. The vessel had a four-day supply of oxygen on board. This means the vessel has less than 30 hours of oxygen supply left. So the rescuers are fighting against time. So far, they've been unsuccessful in finding the vessel. And things aren't optimistic. As explorers, we are pessimistic and objective. And as it stands right now, it would be a miracle if they are recovered alive. I think uh, they may be stuck at the bottom of the ocean. Perhaps there was a breach and water came in. I'm not very optimistic for their return, but uh, you know, it's, it's a cliche, but it's true. If, if this is the end for them, they went out doing something they love. This mission is complex. There has been no communication from the vessel. Visibility is quickly lost below the surface because light cannot penetrate that far. And the area where the vessel was lost faced poor weather conditions. But undeterred, rescuers are working round the clock. Uh, the area that we search is, is roughly about the uh, size of uh, Connecticut. Uh, as we continue on with the search, uh, we're expanding our capabilities to be able to search uh, under the water as well. And so we have a, uh, a commercial vessel that's on scene now uh, that has remote operated uh, vehicles uh, that will uh, give us the ability to uh, search under the water as well. U.S. and Canadian agencies, navies and commercial deep sea firms are all helping the rescue operation. They've involved the use of military planes, a submarine and sonar buoys. These are small marine boys that are used to detect and locate submerged submarines. So underwater acoustic research was conducted to locate the vessel. And today it proved to be a cause of hope. Rescuers heard noises in the area where the submarine went missing. Rescuers say they heard banging noises at 30-minute intervals. So US Navy experts are now analysing the sounds. Some experts say that continuous noises suggest humans. But research is underway to prove it. Many aren't too optimistic. But the world isn't ready to give up hope just yet. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. We're starting with Argentina. Violent protests have erupted there. This is after a constitutional reform restricted the right to protest. Demonstrations are on in Colombia too. Thousands are marching against economic and social reforms pushed by the country's leftist government. In the US, new footage shows the devastating aftermath of a tornado in central Mississippi. And finally, what happened today in history? In the year 1945, American forces captured Okinawa during the Second World War. With this began the Allied invasion of Japan. We're leaving you with these images. Thank you very much for watching, for your patience. We're sorry for all the noise. Like I said, it's a rainy morning in Washington, D.C., but we love bringing the stories to you from wherever we are. We'll see you tomorrow.
bloodiest battle of the Pacific War has ended in victory for the Americans on Okinawa. 330 miles from the home islands of Japan, the stars and stripes are hoisted on this most vital strategic... Una situación completamente descontrolada. Escuchamos que hay respuesta en el... Y ahora sí, la policía que abarra las de goma y también han lanzado gran cantidad de manifestantes que... Cuarto auto y la policía intenta exactamente. Primero con, primero con eh, gas. Miras a la policía, ahí corren el portón, abren el portón directamente. Entonces, rompelo, no saques nada, rompelo. Es impresionante. No para de empezar a avanzar. Thank mm -hmm. you.